I'd like to welcome you to uh, part five of the Olivet Discourse here. And uh, this is a continuation of the Monarchy of Israel part two series. And we uh, left off in verse 14. And uh, <clears throat> I wanted to jump back, or we left off in verse 22. And I wanted to jump back to verse 15 to kind of give you some more clarification of what... Uh, what's going on here in verse 15 and 16 and why I highlighted this as a um, as a example of what happened um, uh, at the um, at the time of the abomination of desolation which was in the midst of the 70th week of Daniel <clears throat> and um, and if you've watched my videos previously on this series you will know, you will see that it, that the seventieth week of Daniel pertains to Jesus Christ. It does not pertain to the Antichrist. A lot of people in dispensationalism, I mean, even post-trib believers will not agree with that. But the fact is the fact. I mean, when you look at what um, Gabriel said regarding the vision in verse twenty-four, it all pertains to the Messiah. And um, and it all pertains to his first advent. But I wanted to come back to um, verse 15 to kind of explain the abomination of desolation. Now, Matthew, the writer here, when he uh, is quoting Jesus, um, there's two words I want you to pay attention here. Okay, Jesus tells his disciples when you so basically he's telling his disciples that you will see this abomination of desolation when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place and then no parentheses and then he kinda switches gears to the readers that you know reads what he's saying here you know make you know in the future that we need to look to Daniel to see what is in reference to regarding the abomination of desolation. Now, when he was speaking to the disciples, you got to put yourself in the mindset of the disciples that they have seen something similar in the past, or it, it, it is kind of still fresh in their minds of what happened in a previous abomination that happened in the rebuilt temple. When you go back to historical records under the Greek king Antiochus Epiphanes which is a type and shadow of what the papacy is now okay so we're gonna get into that but he's saying specifically to his d disciples when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in a holy place then he switches gears and says whosoever readeth let him understand so we are to have the same mindset as the disciples. We have whosoever readeth, that's us. And he was telling the, the disciples that they will see the abomination of desolation. <clears throat> then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Okay, now. The uh, word abomination only appears twice in the book of Daniel and in Daniel 11:31 we clearly see a definition of what this abomination is okay and um, and it reads an arm shall stand on his part and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the daily sacrifice and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate now history tells us that Antiochus Epiphanes did exactly this act. Okay, and I want to bring you to a commentary here by John Gill, which I think is a very accurate account of this. And he and he writes according to Daniel eleven thirty one this: They shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, the temple which stood in Jerusalem, a fortified city, and was itself a building strong and stable, 
and especially it was so called because here the mighty god had his residence, the symbol of which was the ark of his strength, and there he gave strength unto his people, this holy place, sacred to his worship and service. The commanders and soldiers of Antiochus defiled, defiled by entering into it, who were men unholy and unclean, by making it a place of luxury and rioting, of whoredom and all manner of uncleanness, by bringing things into it which were not lawful, and filling the altar with that, with with what was abominable. <clears throat> in the Apocrypha, in Second Maccabees chapter six, it reads in verse four: For the temple was filled with riot and reveling by the Gentiles, who dallied with harlots and had to do with women with within the circuit of the holy places, and besides that, brought in things that were not lawful. The altar also was filled with profane things which the law forbiddeth, particularly by erecting a high place upon the altar and sacrificing swine upon it, as Josephus relates, with which it agrees what is said of Antiochus in the Apocrypha and is written that he ordered uh, in 1 Maccabees 1 verse 46, and pollute the sanctuary and holy people, set up altars and groves and chapels of idols and sacrifice swine's flesh and unclean beasts. So again, in Daniel 11.31, we see clearly this a definition of what an abominable sacrifice is. Okay. And also, if you look at it carefully, you will also notice that, the, that uh, Daniel's people, the Jews, weren't responsible for this specific abomination. Okay. It goes on to say, and shall take away the daily sacrifice. The sacrifice of the lamb in the morning and in the evening, the evening and morning, we referenced that in Daniel chapter 8 with the 2300 evenings and mornings, which the priests were hindered from offering by the crowds of heathens in the temple, or prohibited by the order of Antiochus, for he forbade burnt offerings, sacrifice, and libation to be made in the temple. In the Apocrypha it reads, 1 Maccabees 1, 47, set up all altars and groves and chapels of idols and sacrifice swine's flesh and unclean beasts. So in other words, the abomination of desolation in 1131 was an example of a wrong sacrifice whereby we get our definition. <coughs> Please note that the Hebrew nation was not responsible for the abomination act in Daniel chapter 11. Okay. So when Jesus says, When ye therefore, speaking to his disciples, shall see the abomination of desolation, uh, spoken of by Daniel, we see two words, abomination, connecting with desolation twice, in Daniel 11 and Daniel 12. In Daniel 11, we have a clear definition of what a wrong sacrifice is. Physically. Type. What is the anti-type going to be? Okay. And obviously something is going to happen that after Jesus Christ dies, then therefore these sacrifices that the, the, the Judeans performed even after when he said it is finished, would be considered abominable, meaning God does not recognize these things anymore because Jesus Christ is the perfect sacrifice. Okay, and we're going to get into that. So basically, Jesus was basically telling his disciples, look at what happened before, and then look what's going to happen again. He's basically saying, look to Daniel. And so that's what we're doing. We're looking to Daniel to see what's going on here. Again, the Hebrew nation was not responsible for the abomination acts in Daniel 11. But here we see something interesting in Daniel 12, 11, and 12, 12. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days, or one thousand three hundred and thirty five days. Well, Jesus' ministry was three and a half years long. Okay. 
Here we see the other phrase, abomination that maketh desolate, set up. All right. And there shall be 1,290 days. So we have Jesus Christ crucified. It is finished. They continue their sacrifices pretty much the same day. What, what, did, the, what did the rabbis say? We need to have these bodies removed so we can have our Passover. You know, so they were still making sacrifices even after the temple was rent in twain and these types of things. They were still sacrificing. So from that very day, that abomination of desolation was set up. Bam. Spot on. From day one up until 1,290 days. Well, and then you'll, and, uh, you know, you might question yourself, well, but it says 1,290 days. Half of seven years is three and a half. That's only 1,260 days. That is true. But if you understand the, the calendar and the moon and the, the moon phases and the moon cycles, every so often you have to add a 13th month. And so is it possible that on from 31 AD to 34 AD, was there an extra month added? And how do you determine that? Well, if the new moon or the dark moon falls before the spring equinox, then you have to add another month. And did that happen? Well, let's take a look at that real quick. All right, so basically what I did here was I uh, basically went on my went on Stellarium and I backtracked from 31 AD up to 34 AD, okay? And if there wasn't a 13th month added in between any of these times, then I would have to basically <laughs> rethink everything because I would be wrong, you know, because you have to consider you know this 1290 day ordeal well if you look carefully if you see this blue line this is the equator and this is the ecliptic the um, ecliptic which the Sun rides on okay and if you notice real carefully that when and when the Sun crosses the ecliptic and it goes in this direction when it reaches the center here, right at the crossing point, that is the beginning of the year. That is this that is the spring equinox and the following um and the following month would be the first month of the year or Abib or Nisan. But and that's all determined on the phases of the moon. And what happens is you have a new moon, which is a full dark moon, which is still the last day of the month, and then the following sunset would start the 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 either the first day of the month or the thirteenth of the month if the new moon fell seven days prior to the spring equinox. Okay. And I looked at thirty one AD. There was twelve months. It was a you know there was a twelve month year. I looked at 32 AD, there was a 12 month year, however, in 33 AD, just prior to 34 AD when Stephen was stoned and Paul was blinded on the road to Damascus and these types of things, and this was before Peter's vision of the clean and unclean animals in reference to the Gentiles, you know, and, you know, and these types of things. Okay. Well, the sun has not crossed the the uh, the equator. It is not the first. It, you know, it has not. Spring has not sprung basically. And I'm looking, and I did the snapshot at looking at uh, looking at it from Jerusalem. So here we have the moon. And I centered on the moon, and if you look real carefully, the illumination is 0.0%. .0 this was March 19th, 33 AD, and the sun has not crossed the spring equinox. So what does that mean? 
that means another 30 day month was added and that would clearly explain the extra 30 days to 1260 days or the last three and a half years of the 70th week of Daniel so that has happened within the, the last three and a half years the very last year prior to 34 AD so how do we put this in perspective well you go back to scripture here and it says 1290 days and blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to 1305 and 30 days or 1335 days so what does that mean well in 34 AD you had Stephen being stoned and then you had Paul on the road to Damascus getting blinded and then a man from Cornelius is being sent by God you know to go unto Paul you know and these types of things and then basically you know the 1290 days which was 33 AD okay the extra 30th month and then 45 days after the 1290 days is expired basically you have the aspect of I think it's in Acts chapter 8 or 9 when there was a dispute among you know Paul and Barnabas and the Jews and he basically said you know uh, that we basically now turn to the Gentiles and these types of things okay and this was at the time that Peter received his visions of the clean and unclean and God telling him uh, God telling Peter do not call what I have chosen unclean or you know and these types of things so clearly that would explain you know the 45 days after 1290 days you know if this is the case I'm not gonna say I'm 100 percent sure but it's very interesting that you have a 13th month added in 30 33 AD which would explain the extra 30 days and then 45 days after that after uh, the the 70th week of Daniel is fulfilled you have the gospel going to the Gentiles at at 34 AD as well so that's very interesting when we look at it in that light okay so now that we went over Daniel 11 we got an example of what a wrongful sacrifice is is then we looked at Daniel 12 we we kind of briefly went over the 1290 days and 1335 days and we also seen the term abomination of desolation being set up okay and I I stated that that abomination of desolation was set up on the very same day that Jesus Christ in his final three words said it is finished and he gave up the ghost now we're gonna go over some scripture to basically prove this is the case and hopefully this will clear things up as what this abomination is as it pertains to its fulfillment In the last week of Daniel and you know from 31 AD or from 27 AD to 34 AD and in the midst of the week Messiah being cut off killed Messiah confirming the covenant for seven years three and a half years into his ministry cut off and killed three and a half years later you know the gospel you know Stephen Stone gospel goes to the Gentiles and these types of things hopefully this will explain everything very clearly okay that the one that confirms this covenant which is not the old covenant but confirms a new covenant not a covenant of sacrifice of bulls and goats but a final atonement a final sacrifice a perfect sacrifice once and for all and it's finished there is nothing left meaning that once he is cut off from that particular point 
every sacrifice that the Jews made in that temple was never recognized by God again because it was now considered an abomination which still is today has not changed and it still will be if they erect a third temple over there Hebrews 9 6 through 12 now when these things were thus ordained the priests went always into the first tabernacle accomplishing the service of God but into the second went the high priest alone once every year not without blood which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people sound familiar what the priest did once a year the Holy Ghost this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing or the temple which was a figure for the time then present you know at this time present time at the time of this writing and which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience so now we here have a mindset that this is not talking about a physical sacrifice that we are to make spiritual sacrifices you know spiritual sacrifices to God <clears throat> which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances and supposed on them until the time of reformation but Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is to say, not of this building, speaking of the temple, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So that was it. That was the final cutoff point. <sighs> and that was at the middle of that 70th week. Matthew 27, 15, 51, and John 19, 28 through 30. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. So when that veil of the temple was rent in twain, that was it. Jesus Christ was the perfect sacrifice that gave us access into the most holy place. That was basically a type or a figure of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. Speaking of Moses. So therefore, we can enter into that most holy place in communion with God in prayer, fasting, these type of things in prayer. We have direct communication to the Father because of that one perfect sacrifice. And that was it. It was done. That was exactly at the middle point of the final week of Daniel. <clears throat> after this, Jesus knowing, this is John 19, 28 through 30. After this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon a hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. It is finished. He is that perfect sacrifice. He is the way into the most holy place. It is not by a physical high priest here on earth. For Jesus Christ is our high priest, who forever makes intercession for us. Okay, he did it once by the shedding of his own blood. Basically giving us an example of what the Old Testament and the Torah showed us. And with the sacrifices of, blood, of, of the blood of bulls and goats and sheep and these type of things, this was all a foreshadow of what Christ did at that very moment. Three and a half years in of his ministry that final week of Daniel okay in the midst of the week 
he was cut off. He confirmed a covenant with many for one week. In the midst of the week, he was cut off. That was that starting point of that. And that very night, they sacrificed the lamb for Passover, for their Passover, mind you, the Pharisees, the Jews of that time. So from that time forward, that was the abomination of desolation. And those that understood what Jesus was saying there recognized it. Because he said, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. Okay. Whosoever, you know, spoken of by the prophet Daniel. Then he then Matthew tells us the readers of his gospel, whosoever readeth, let him understand. Because if you notice that parentheses, that's not in red letters. That's basically Matthew telling us we need to understand this. Daniel 9.27, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, that he pertains to the Messiah, not the Antichrist. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause a sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and he did just that, even though they continued from that very day on his, you know, when Jesus Christ gave up the ghost. There was no sacrifice, there was no animal sacrifice for the remission of sins. It was done, it was over with. So the sacrifice and the oblation did cease. And the, and the Jewish nation, the Judeans, or the Hebrew nation, was responsible for this abomination of desolation. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. Jesus Christ said, your house is left unto you desolate. Speaking of the temple. Even till the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. <clears throat> and then finally in Malachi 3 1 behold I will send my messenger this right here now pay attention here very closely behold I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me that right there is speaking of John the Baptist and then notice a little semicolon there so we have another messenger mess you know mentioned here and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his, to his temple. You know, uh, Jesus Christ had, Christ had a zeal for his father's house, didn't he? Look what he did with the money changers. Even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, who better to fulfill this confirmed covenant that Jesus Christ is going to confirm with many for one week. Who better to confirm that than the messenger of the covenant? Okay. That's what you've got to really think about. Who me delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. So I basically wanted to come at you and explain this abomination of desolation. Now, obviously, do we have abomination, uh, a abomination of desolations happening now? Well, all you have to do is look no further than the Vatican and the papacy to do that. All you have to do is look no further than the World Council of Churches and all the daughters of the whore returning to her, returning to the mother whore and these types of things. And you do have an abomination of desolation that's been going on for quite some time. But, at the same time, you know, <laughs> hey, you know, this actual abomination of desolation revolved around sacrifice, okay? And and Jesus was telling his disciples, when you see this, meaning that the disciples will see this, the disciples of Jesus Christ at that time, then Matthew takes us away from what Jesus was saying, and he inscribes in his little... Uh, Parentheses, whosoever readeth, let him understand. Then it says, following, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains and these types of things. And that happened precisely 40 years later in 70 AD. So in the next video, we're going to go over um, Matthew 24, 23 through... 
51. And um, you're going to kind of see a little bit of more of a going back and forth from a, from a general view, a little bit of talking about the specific generation in of Jesus' time, you know, with the disciples. But mostly it's going to be pertaining about the time of his return and a general overview of the entire last days that started in the time of Acts, basically, or basically at the closing of the 70th week of Daniel. And then uh, after that, we're going to close this portion of Monarchy of Israel with um, um, a historical account of what happened during 70 AD. And it's quite brutal it's quite um it's quite hair raising and then we're gonna um basically go over the aspect of not one stone will be left upon another and i'm gonna play that audio interview that i promised at the beginning of this series and then we'll continue and go forward from there okay because i got a lot of things that i want to talk about regarding israel and these types of things and there's a lot more to cover, okay, but um, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. We're almost there, and um, I hope so far that this series has been a blessing to you. Um, I know probably a lot of people are not going to agree with these things, but um, it's not my, it's not, that's not the point. Whether you agree or disagree, um, that's totally up to you. So, till next time, truth be told, truth be known, stay safe, God bless, we will see you next time. Bye-bye. And, um, and it all pertains to his first advent. But I wanted to come back to, um, verse 15 to kind of explain the abomination of desolation. Now, Matthew, the writer here, when he, uh, is... Quoting Jesus, um, there's two words I want you to pay attention here. Okay. Jesus tells his disciples, when you, so basically he's telling his disciples that you will see this abomination of desolation. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, and then no parentheses, and then he kind of switches gears to the readers that you know reads what he's saying here you know like you know in the future that we need to look to Daniel to the disciples that they will see the abomination of desolation <clears throat> then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains okay now The uh, word abomination only appears twice in the book of Daniel. And in Daniel 11.31, we clearly see a definition of what this abomination is. Okay? And, um, and it reads, An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Now, history tells us that Antiochus Epiphanes did exactly this act. Okay, and I want to give you some more clarification of what uh, what's going on here in verse 15 and 16, and why I highlighted this as a um, as a example of what happened. Um, uh, at the um, at the time of the abomination of desolation, which was in the midst of the seventieth week of Daniel, <clears throat> and um, and if you've watched my videos previously on this series, you will know, you will see that it, that the seventieth week of Daniel pertains to Jesus Christ. It does not pertain to the Antichrist. 
a lot of people in dispensationalism, I mean, even post-trib believers will not agree with that, but the fact is the fact. I mean, when you look at what um, Gabriel said regarding the vision of verse 24, it all pertains to the Messiah. And I'd like to welcome you to uh, part five of the Olivet Discourse here. And uh, this is a continuation of the Monarchy of Israel part two series. And we uh, left off in verse 14. And uh, <clears throat> I wanted to jump back, or we left off in verse 22. And I wanted to jump back to verse 15 to kind of see what is in reference to regarding the abomination of desolation. Now, when he was speaking to the disciples, you've got to put yourself in the mindset of the disciples that they have seen something similar in the past or it, it is kind of still fresh in their minds of what happened in a previous abomination that happened in the rebuilt temple. When you go back to historical records under the Greek king Antiochus Epiphanes, which is a type and shadow of what the papacy is now, okay? So, we're going to get into that. But he's saying specifically to his d disciples, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in a holy place. Then he switches gears and says, Whosoever readeth, let him understand. So we are to have the same mindset as the disciples. We have whosoever readeth, that's us. And he was telling the 